Timing. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to um, our webinar. This is the first of our series of webinars in May for Preservation Month. Um, we're so excited. It is our favorite month of the year here at the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, and we're really glad that you could all join us today. Um, so my name is Mallory Bauer, and I have the privilege of serving as the field representative for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. And I am joined here today um, with by Nathan Metering with the State Historic Preservation Office. We're really excited. Um, MHPN and the SHPO partner on a lot of projects, and um, sometimes uh, people confuse uh, our two organizations. So we will be spending a few minutes at the end of the presentation to today to talk about um, whom, which organization you should reach out to depending on, on what you are working on in your community. So we're really uh, thankful and grateful for this partnership. Um, so today we are using Zoom for our webinar platform. I'm sure many of you are getting very familiar with the various um, uh, remote platforms with which to communicate with each other. Um, the chat I thought was disabled, but um, it I have already received chats from everybody, so that is perfectly fine. But if you have a question that you want to present to the panelists that we will answer at the end, please type that into the Q&A box. Um, that way it doesn't get lost, your question doesn't get lost in the chat and it allows us to really focus in and, and make sure that we answer those questions. The Q&A box will be found in your row of tools. So if you uh, are just seeing the screen and you don't see a toolbar, you might have to just wiggle your mouse a little bit um, towards the top or the bottom of the screen and your toolbox will uh, pop up and there's a little Q&A button, little two talking blurbs that you can click on and type in your question. We will be typing some things and resources into the chat. So if we say check out the chat box for a re link to a resource that we talk about, um, that's where you can find that information. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and we will send out a link to view the recording to everybody who registered and it'll even be available to those who did not. So we're really um, hoping that this will be a great resource for many people. So if you enjoyed it, which we hope you will, you can share that link far and wide. Um, the more the merrier. We, this is uh, one of the things that's part of our mission is to educate people on historic preservation and this is how we live into that. All right, so today you are joining us for Historic Preservation 101, and it really will be a, kind of a survey course on what historic preservation is. So we will be talking about where it kind of originated, some of the important milestones in the preservation, um, in creating preservation as like a field, as part of our um, community ethic. And we'll also be talking about why it's important, why it can add value to your community in so many different ways. We'll also briefly talk about designations um, and what designations mean. And then, like I said, at the end, we'll wrap up with a, an explanation about what the State Historic Preservation Office does and what the Michigan Historic Preservation or Michigan Historic Preservation Network does. Um, and then we'll wrap up with um, Q and A's. So as I said, um, I serve uh, for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network and our mission is to advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place and connection to the past. We are a membership organization. If you are just learning about us today or are interested more in learning about our membership program, um, go to our website, which is www.mhpn.org. We cannot do what we are able to accomplish without our members and volunteers. So if you are a member or have volunteered with us in the past, thank you so much for your, uh, your participation and engagement. We really appreciate you. And we also want to thank um, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, our webinar series throughout the end of September are funded through a generous grant from these organizations and we really appreciate their support as well. All right, and so I will turn it over to Nathan now um, and he's going to uh, start talking about, well, in general, what is historic preservation? 
Hi, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Nathan Niedering. I'm the internal project coordinator and the communications liaison for the State Historic Preservation Office, which is a unit of state government in Lansing. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about what the State Historic Preservation Office, or the SHPO, um, does a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but first, I'm going to go over just what is historic preservation, um, what are some of the origins of the preservation movement, um, and kind of why does preservation matter? What is the value of preservation? Why does it impact and how does it impact communities? Um, and how do people, individuals, play a role in making that happen? So um, the first is, what is historic preservation? Um, and it's basically a movement to reuse old buildings um, and keep historic areas vital because a place's history and it's a built environment are tied directly to its people and to its culture. Um, and in the simplest terms, historic preservation is simply having the good sense to hold on to things that are well designed, things that link us with our past in a meaningful way, and that have plenty of good use left in them. Uh, this is a quote by Richard Moe. He's the former president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, but basically, you know, even if one building, if a building's initial use may no longer be needed, it doesn't mean necessarily that the building itself isn't valuable. Um, and could potentially serve a new use in the future. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, we will take a look at the origins of the preservation movement. Um, preservation did not start as one cohesive movement from all corners of the country. I mean, truly it was started in individual places, um, typically places of important significance, um, which became endangered for some reason Way. And so there was sort of a grassroots effort around each one of these places to say, hey, wait a minute, this matters. Um, and this is important and we need to think about what we want to do to protect this and save this. Um, and so even places like Mount Vernon, Monticello, Independence Hall, places that we think of as like critically important to the history of the United States, um, at one point were threatened in some way. And so a local group of people got together and said, this place is important, this place matters, and we need to, to take on some work in order to save it and protect it. Um, elsewhere, residents came together to recognize that places such as Charleston or Savannah or New Orleans were unique in their development, and the development was embodied by the specific architecture or the sense of place that you have when you were in each one of those cities. Um, and so there were sort of citywide movements to say, hey, wait a minute, our places matter too, and we need to protect them. So next slide. Um, really, the cohesive preservation movement um, came together uh, around in the 1960s, um, and it was very reactionary. Um, at that time, there were countrywide undertakings, uh, programs such as urban renewal and the Federal Highway um, you know, Project, which largely sought to revitalize cities, um, but their method for doing that was to tear everything down, throw it in a landfill, and come up with something new. Um, and so people really recognize that, hey, wait a minute, we don't have a say in what's happening. A lot of these decisions are being made by other people in faraway places. And more importantly, is there anything that, that is important there? You know, you're just coming in with bulldozers and going straight across the landscape. Maybe there's something important, even though some of it may, may have to go. Um, and so really, it was sort of this uh, realization that led to um, the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, um, which was an act enabled by Congress. Um, it's actually the first environmental act. If you think about the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Act, the Clean Air Act, those all took place in the 1960s and 70s, but the National Historic Preservation Act was actually the first. Um, in the creation of the Historic Preservation Act, um, it created a State Historic Preservation Office, or an SHPO, or a SHPO, um, all the same thing in every state. Um, and it also created specific programs for the SHPO in each state to manage. Um, most specifically, that would be the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and also, a portion of the Act, Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act, um, which we commonly refer to in business as just Section 106, refers to a specific review of federally funded projects that has to take place now, just as you would do a review for um, endangered species or impacts on water. Now we're talking about cultural resources and historic places and making sure that uh, impacts to those are taken into account as well. 
And we'll discuss those in, in a few minutes in this presentation. Next slide. So why does this matter? What is important about preservation? Why are people, why do people think that this is worth fighting for? Um, uh, I will say also that uh, as historic preservation, right, 50 or 60 years has, has passed on, we've come to realize that um, we, we aren't just looking at things that we consider to be old 50 or 60 years ago. New places uh, or more recent places have attained a level of historical significance um, sort of in the meantime, over the last 50 some years. Um, and so really this is a continuous effort. We don't just draw a line in the sand and say everything built before 1900 is historic, but everything more recent than that doesn't really matter as much. Um, the boundary is always kind of moving along with the passage of time. Um, and so really uh, we all have a continuous um, obligation and make a continuous effort to continue to do the work of researching, inventorying, um, and taking taking stock of what is in our communities, what places um, do community us matter, um, and then what can we do to make sure that those places are protected. So why does, why does this matter? What is the value of doing historic preservation as a field, as a profession, um, or just as a volunteer in your own community? Um, really one of the most important things is quality of environment and quality of life. Um, Historic preservation has actually become recognized as an effective uh, uh, economic development strategy and also as a tool to enhance people's quality of life. Investing in communities' historic places includes uh, buildings, districts, structures, uh, which might be things like bridges, um, objects, those might be statues or monuments, um, and really investing in those supports and grows the local economy. It curbs sprawl um, and it reduces construction waste. And it adds variety and texture to a community's streetscapes, landscapes, and neighborhoods. Really what sets this community apart from every other community around it. Many of the features that people associate with quality living environments, such as access to natural beauty, walkable downtowns and neighborhoods, and varied architecture, are built right into neighborhoods that we would consider to be older or historic. In older communities, the orientation and the focus is on pedestrians and the sense of community um, revolving around walkability in, instead of the car. People are really encouraged to gather and spend time instead of just to drive through and keep going. That walkability and the varied architecture on the street are some of the features that add up to a high quality of life. People have told us this. This isn't just something we're saying. This is something that people say again and again. So historic preservation has actually been established as, at both the federal and the state level as a public purpose. Government recognizes that our historic places and landscapes are important and that government can play a role to both recognize and protect them by regulation. Next slide. So historic preservation can be part of a strategy to attract uh, economic development as well. It's meant to be um, an active fluid part of a community. It's not that old places are just saved and then they're set there and they have no function in the community. Economic development is a very important driver of historic preservation, or rather historic preservation can be a very important driver of economic development. Um, preservation is actively part of a strategy to attract large firms and attract, attract and retain small businesses. Businesses will choose to invest where their employees will thrive. Uh, and sort of in recognition of this, the SHPO office, um, was recently transferred within state government uh, to work very closely with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And this transfer was in part due to the recognition that historic preservation and community development do have this direct connection with business attraction and business development. Dollar for dollar, historic preservation is one of the highest job generating economic development options available. In the state of Michigan, a $1 million investment in a building rehabilitation creates eight more jobs than a $1 million investment in manufacturing, say for car parts or car accessories. Rehabilitation creates more jobs than new construction. Furthermore, when you compare building rehabilitation to new construction, rehab money 
um, is much more likely to stay in the local economy than money generated by new construction. For example, if you think about it, a rehab project tends to require more specialized labor than a new construction project. And that labor, carpenters, electrician, uh, tradesmen, craftsmen, typically will be hired locally. And then chances are that local labor, those tradesmen will also locally on products and services. Even during times of a recession, when things are not good, in the economy, rehab projects are often more feasible because their scale tends to be smaller and they're often more affordable. And of course, the local labor keeps the value of those dollars right in the local community, providing a larger positive impact. The whole idea is to make your city a desirable destination and to attract people who will stay. Historic preservation gives cities and towns a sense of place so that people are drawn to them. And the strategy works for both large and small communities and for large and small firms. In addition, the size of old buildings and the rent for historic structures is typically right for small businesses, which are often the economic engines of cities and towns of all sizes. People also seek authentic experiences when they travel. These are places that have character. It's a place where there is a there, there. We're gonna go there, what does there mean? Studies show that Heritage tourists stay longer in communities and spend more money. We know that 65% of Americans who traveled more than 50 miles one way included a cultural or historic destination experience on their trip. We also know that museum visits and visits to cultural institutions drive revenue in other places, such as restaurants and shops. In Michigan, a recent study by Michigan State University found that for every dollar spent in a museum, another $7.75 is spent in the surrounding community. If you think about, for a moment, just a visit to Mackinac Island, right? A very pure Michigan sort of destination. We can all be honest that the real destination might be the fudge, but would people still go to Mackinac if there was no aspect of the culture that makes that a special and unique place? Even if you're not a history buff, a horse carriage ride or a bike ride, exploring the stores and the homes and visiting the Colonial Fort are all part of the experience of going to Mackinac Island. Next slide. So just to quickly reiterate, heritage tourism is also an important component of the historic preservation movement. Um, it is a component that doesn't just bring people to a town to stay, to consider moving there, but also to have people visit from across the state and, and across the country and beyond both for those authentic experiences. Next slide. So how do we do this? What's the process for making historic preservation happen? Um, we need to use the tools that we have. Uh, we need to work smart and be proactive and consider what we have in our community today. What are the, the assets that we have? Even if they don't look particularly beautiful at the start, what are the things that make our community special? We need to be very intentional in engaging the, the local community and stakeholders when we're thinking about preservation projects. What does the community want? What does the community need? What are they asking for? And then most importantly, we need to work on forging partnerships. Um, and this is part of how uh, the Michigan Historic Preservation Network works with the State Historic Preservation Office and both of our entities work with individuals, nonprofits, community governments, and beyond to really make this happen. Well, I will now turn this back over to Mallory. She's going to discuss um, the different levels of historic designation. This is something you may have heard of. Um, and she's also going to talk a little bit more about what the Michigan Historic Preservation Network does in the preservation community. Thanks, Nathan. Um, all right, so let's move into designation. So before we um, begin our discussion on the three different types of designations. I do want to do a plug for our next webinar in our webinar series, which will be focused on, um, so you want to designate an old property. And um, we have uh, representatives from the staff who um, oversee um, some of these programs who will be answering questions and going over the application process and covering um, some of the more deeper questions that we won't even really have time to touch on today. So if you have not yet registered, um, that 
um, webinar will be on um, May 21st at 1 p.m. and I'm going to send out a link to our website where you can register in the chat box um, before we get started. Um, so when we talk about designations, uh, there can often be um, some confusion because not every not everyone understands that there are different levels of designation and if a property or a building is registered or is has a designation under one type um, of one level it does not mean that they are automatically designated under the other levels um, so when i say a level um, we'll start at the federal level with the national register of historic places then we're going to move down to the state level which michigan has our wonderful state marker program with those great uh, signs with um, the wolverine on it and then we'll move into the local historic district which is managed by local communities and governments um, so that's how we're going to move through these designation pro this designation process. So first of all, what is the National Register? Um, going back to, to what Nathan was talking about when um, historic preservation was coming in to its own in the 60s, um, it was a list of places that have um, significance on either the federal, the state, or the local level um, that um, A community wants to recognize and designate. Um, so it doesn't have to, because it's a federal uh, level, it does not mean that it has to be a federally or a national significant moment that happened there, right? The caveat of like, did George Washington sleep in this building? No, he didn't make it to Michigan. Um, but if it's a local uh, individual or event, it still can be listed in the National Register. Um, this program is administered by the National State, uh, the National Park S Service, and um, the application process does go through our Michigan State Historic Preservation Office. So a, a couple different levels of um, application and then acceptance um, and official designation. One part of the National Register that I think often is misunderstood is that the National Register is strictly honorary. It is not a protective designation. So when someone or a community approaches me and says, we want to protect this building, we think it should be a National Register site. And that will save it and it'll live off, live into the future indefinitely. Um, unfortunately, there are no restrictions about demolishing um, a property on the National Register um, unless, and we, but there are a few caveats to that which we will touch on in the next slide. Um, so when thinking about the National Register, there are four criteria with which um, we can look at a property and determine if it is eligible. Um, the first one is if that uh, location, or building or landscape is associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history or two it is associated with the lives of persons significant in our past um, three that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type period or method of construction or that represent the work of a master or that possesses high artistic values, or that represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual, individual distinction. Or finally, um, it is a site that has the potential to yield or has already yielded information important to prehistory or history. So that is an archeological significance. And um, we can learn a lot from that site. Um, the third one that I read, which was very wordy, is essentially if it has architectural significance. The building shows great marks, uh, craftsmanship, um, or it is really exemplative of a, of a style um, uh, found locally um, in the state or throughout the nation. Um, so just to summarize that one. All right. So why might 
someone want to pursue a National Register listing if it is not going to protect the building? Well, first of all, a National Register um, designation can really raise awareness and, and create a sense of pride um, connected to a historic place in your community. Um, there are many communities who uh, really encourage that sense of pride um, when we get a historic downtown or a downtown area designated um, in the National Register of Historic Places. There can be a lot of press talking about the, the community and its history and celebrating the story um, that is told in those buildings and in that place. Um, additionally, uh, some people pursue a listing because um, they, it gives them access to the federal um, rehab uh, historic tax credit, which uh, allows um, up to 20% um, tax credit on your income, income tax, um, which is, uh, can often close the funding gap required to reinvest in some older properties that may have deferred maintenance. Um, it's a really great program. We are working to bring back the state historic tax credit program, which um, we have a webinar at the end of this month on the 28th to talk about our um, work on that as well. So register for that webinar as well. So this is uh, the third point kind of goes into that a caveat. There are some protections for national register properties. Um, if federal funds will be used in the project or undertaking is the, the technical term for it, or if federal permits or licenses are required for the project as well. Um, so that um, when federal dollars or permits or licenses are required for a project, say like a road widening project, um, that initiates the section 106, again, going back to the, the act in, um, the, the 1960s and that moves us moves professionals uh, and communities and federal agencies working on that project through a process that identifies if historic properties will be impacted by this project um, and if that impact will adversely impact a historic property and they follow the criteria for the national register listing um, and if possible, um, those adverse effects need to be mitigated. Um, so that is where it does allow for some protection there um, for a National Register property. Um, National Register listings do not need reviews. Um, whenever there's work done, um, rehab work, um, the property owners do not have to, to go through a permitting a, a process beyond what their local permit process through the building department require. So going on to one step, uh, our next step, which is our State Register of Historic Sites. Um, so in Michigan, we call this our Michigan um, Historical Marker Program. Again, those beautiful green signs with our Wolverine on top. Um, if you're walking around uh, most communities, you'll see one or two. The state uh, website now has a great uh, digital map where you can look up the location of historic marker sites throughout the state. So if you're interested in finding out which um, sites around you may already have this designation, um, you can check out their website. Um, these markers are, again, very honorary. They do not protect the property from demolition. Um, those who apply for a marker um, need to provide the research about the property to the state and it goes through a review process and then the marker is paid for by the organization that is applying for that um, designation as well. So again, state historical markers, um, again, raise awareness and pride. Um, they're right out front. Um, some buildings or uh, districts that are in the National Register will have a plaque to show their pride in that, in that designation. Um, but the state marker program, um, every site has one as long as it's you know, not um, 
vandalized or stolen um, and the organization applying wants to pay for one. Um, they're also a great educational tool. Um, they have a script written based on the research provided that give a brief summary about why this place or this building is important. So people can stop and read. There are um, a lot of people who will specifically stop to read marker programs. Um, and then when you see a marker, you realize, right, we, we know as Michiganders that this marker means that something important or something in, that impacted this community or my community, if you're in your, in your own, um, that I should know about. And so sometimes it, you'll get people, it, it helps people orientate themselves to what is in their surroundings. Um, otherwise they could walk by a really important place where um, there was a really important event in their community and they wouldn't know because it wasn't um, communicated to them. It is a really great opportunity to encourage preservation in your community. Again, when you're doing your research and you're preparing your narrative, you are creating um, you are creating the story, you are researching the story and bringing that up to light, which you can share with others. Um, for communities just beginning their preservation journey, um, State Marker is always a great place to start because you can have a dedication ceremony, you can make a lot of great fanfare about it. It's a very popular program. A lot of people love the State Historical Marker Program. Um, so it's a really great way to, to get that started. Um, in terms of preservation, uh, it is um, requested or uh, owners of locations in the State Marker Program um, are asked to follow the Secretary of Interior standards, which if you boil it down very rudimentary, it means keep what is um, original, if it is uh, repairable, and if it is not repairable, if something needs to be um, fixed, um, replace it with a material that is not going to hurt the rest of the historic fabric and matches the original as much as possible. And the, if I have not already said it, um, the State Historical Marker Program is run through the Michigan History Center. So now we'll move down one more layer of um, government to our local historic district. And this is a historically significant area that is protected by local ordinance. So the local historic districts are really a community led effort that requires a lot of education and thoughtfulness um, and can be a really great um, community law and program to protect historic fabric into the future. And really, the local historic district um, uses the Secretary for Interior Standards for rehabilitation, as I said with the um, state marker program. If you really distill it down, it's to repair what is repairable of the historic fabric and the materials in the building. And if they are beyond repair, to replace them with materials that are not going to negatively impact the historic materials and mimic or give the same effect as the historic materials. And really, the local historic districts helps to manage change in an area um, that is uh, historically significant. So many people are asked, well, why should we have a local historic district? Um, usually like the state marker programs, there are districts, the National Register does have districts, but often they're single buildings. But a local historic district um, can also have single resources, but usually they are areas in a community that have follow the same development pattern um, and tell a, a important story in the creation and development of a community that um, people want to protect to make sure that that landscape continues into the future for um, people, uh, generations in the future to see and appreciate. So um, again, a way to manage change 
the standards for rehab, again, I'm really summarizing the local historic district. All three of these designations could have their own webinar just focusing on the nuances of the designations. Um, but we'll paint with really broad strokes because I do want to move into what we do as an organization. Um, so local historic districts can manage change. They protect property values. Um, MHPN has done uh, property value studies where we looked at the values of properties within a historic district and similar properties just outside and the historic district. And we saw that property values inside the historic district maintain or increased in value as opposed to similar properties outside. Um, if you have a local historic district, you have access to the certified local government program, which we had a webinar back in April. Um, and that is um, was recorded and put online. So you can find that recording. Um, there's great economic benefits. I'm gonna skip over this because Nathan covered that in his, um, in his earlier presentation. Um, and again, you know, protecting your sense of place protects your quality of life. Um, so just a brief uh, summary, we have the National Register of Historic Places, no protection. There are some tax benefits through the Federal Rehab Tax Credit. Um, our state historic marker program, no protection, no tax benefits, and our local historic district. Um, there is um, protection because you have a commission that is overseeing applications for change and they go apply it to the Secretary of Interior Standards, but no tax benefit. So now we're going to quickly move into what what MHPN does as an organization. At the beginning of the webinar, I said we advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We serve throughout Michigan, all of the counties, um, up into the UP, uh, and we do a lot of work. And primarily, uh, one of our programs that we do is advocacy. Um, so because we are a nonprofit, we do advocate and speak to lawmakers um, about legislation that uh, helps uh, preservation and communities and organizations and property owners who want to engage with uh, preservation to pr uh, protect and reuse their buildings and, structure and structures. We, have, we attend Federal Advocacy Week in Washington, D.C. We also host an annual Advocacy Day in Lansing. Um, and this past several years, we've been working hard to bring back the State Historic Preservation Tax Credit. Um, it is still uh, alive and we are working very hard to um, have that come back. Uh, it's a great economic development tool, which is something that will be very useful in the future. Again, if you want more information on that specific topic, please register for our webinar on May 28th. Additionally, we do local advocacy through our field services. So I will go out and meet with community leaders um, and talk about things like local historic districts, um, or what other designations might help them in their preservation efforts. So that's a beautiful picture of our state capitol building. Um, so we also work on preservation. Um, we have revolving loan programs. We have two of them, a pre-development loan and an intervention loan. Um, these are low interest loans that can help people um, actually do physical work on their buildings. Additionally, we hold easements um, on 25 properties across Michigan. And our easements, we um, monitor every year and um, we make sure that uh, the work done on those properties are appropriate and follow the Secretary of Interior standards as well. Um, so these are properties that we oversee that are outside like local historic districts that would have that type of oversight. We also have a revolving fund for projects, our Lakewood House in Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood in Detroit, which was a property we bought and we rehabbed and then sold um, to help increase property values in that neighborhood. And then we also do some tax credit investment programs. Um, so that's a great, uh, in the upper right corner, their Jefferson Chalmers house uh, before and after we did our work on it. Um, uh, the building below that is the Thompson block, which uh, received one of our loans, um, which is a really cool building. 
and we're really, I'm really excited to see that one. And then um, I cannot remember the building on the, why can't I remember the building? Um, but that one is in Detroit, which we have helped out with as well. Um, we also offer training and events. Um, so if you are interested in bringing MHPN to your community to do something like a, a Historic Preservation 101 or what is a local historic district presentation, that is something we are happy to do for you. Um, we also do hands-on demonstrations and um, we can do all day workshops if that is something you're also interested in doing. Um, our annual conference is usually held in Preservation Month in May, and, but it, uh, due to COVID-19, we have postponed it to September 20th through 30, um, 23rd. Um, so look for information if you are interested in registering. It's a great opportunity to learn a lot about preservation and what people are doing throughout the state. We also, um, have our preservation awards, we have a fall benefit that brings people together, um, and we had a Living Trades Academy in Detroit in 2018 that provided training um, on trades like wood windows, plaster, um, and, and masonry work um, in 2018, which um, we are, you know, we are thinking about how we can, might, we can do that again in the future. So this is a collage of pictures of uh, how we get people together and we network with one another, um, the preservation network, so that people can learn from each other and continue to work on historic preservation in communities throughout the state. Um, finally, we have a lot of resources that we, um, we have put together, primarily our Historic Resource Council directory, which is a guide that lists preservation trades people and professional. Um, that is on our website. All of these resources are on our website, which if you have not checked out, I would highly recommend it. So you can see all of the things that we have to offer and that is www.mhpn.org. All right. So. All right. So without further ado, I will switch, uh, transfer it back over to Nathan so he can talk to you guys about what the State Historic Preservation Office does. Right. Hello again. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the program that state historic preservation offices were established as part of this National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And that act basically said that we think preservation is an important national priority, but we recognize at the federal level that we don't know everything about what is significant in each community or area of the country. So they basically said, We'll, we'll manage the program across the country, but we're gonna delegate it down to the states that each state will have a state historic preservation office in order to um, sort of highlight and, and recognize what is most important at the state level in each state and territory around the country. So SHPO offices were created um, and the act basically created the partnership between the states and the federal level, which is the National Park Service. They are a federal partner. Um, each state historic preservation office um, receives a federal allocation, which then has to be matched by state dollars. So there's both federal and state money that um, goes into running a state historic preservation office. And really the SHPO or the SHPO administers, administers specific programs within the state of Michigan. If we can go to the next slide. So really the SHPO, the structure of the SHPO um, can be divided generally into three areas. The first is identification and, and historic designation. The second is um, incentives and development. And the third is cultural resource management and planning. And when I say cultural resource, um, that's really a summary of everything. That's historic buildings, um, historic districts, uh, structures, objects, archeological sites, um, and more that all kind of get lumped together under the term cultural resources. So if we can go next. Uh, yes, so just a moment ago, I mentioned archeology. span And first we need to just take a moment to do a little bit of digging. Um, when you think about historic places, maybe not top of your mind is an archeological site, um, at least here in Michigan. But, you know, truly history started before we were building buildings here. There were people um, in places around what has now become the state of Michigan that left traces of their existence from the time that they were here occupying different places around the state. Um, and so 
Uh, we have an archaeologist on the staff at the SHPO, um, and we work very closely with all 12 of the recognized Native American tribes in the state. We work closely with other state agencies, such as the Department of Natural Resources um, and MDOT, uh, who also have archaeologists um, and tend to do a lot of work on the ground around the state of Michigan. We work closely with university programs, um, and we talk to citizens of the state of Michigan every week who call us saying, hey, I found an arrowhead, hey, I found some pottery, hey, I found a bone or more. Um, and we try to be able to help connect them with resources in their area to figure out what it is that they've found and if there is significance to it um, and, and what they should do about it. Because a lot of people don't know what to do. Um, and so often our office is the first point of contact. Um, this is a great photo. This is up in Fayette State Park in the Upper Peninsula. They were going to replace the floor in one of the buildings um, in the historic village site and they started taking the, the floorboards out um, and recognized, oh my gosh, we, there are other foundations below this building. And so it turned into sort of a major excavation site to uncover what was there, um, what the building looked like or what was there before the current building was built and the current one is over 100 years old now. So. Um, the, the archaeology aspect is very interesting, and that's another part of what we do at SHPO. We can jump to the next slide. So I'll sort of go through those three areas fairly quickly, um, just to give you a very oh, uh, highlight overview of, of what it does. Um, really, the basis for everything is knowing what you have, or discovering what there is that may be historic um, across the state, in local communities, in rural areas, and everywhere in between. Um, and really that process, um, we call it survey and identification. And it's basically taking a look at specific areas and saying, okay, what is here? And you do some documentation and a little preliminary research and um, you sort of explore what there is, what currently exists. Um, and then you say, okay, this might be important to the story of this place. Um, and you kind of recognize where those areas are. Uh, surveys. Um, can sort of take two different forms. One might be a geographic survey where you might say, okay, we're gonna survey this particular neighborhood or we're gonna survey both sides of this particular street um, or something like that. Uh, the other type of survey is a little, a little bit more thematic. Um, so it might be, um, we are gonna survey all of the maritime history structures um, around Muskegon Lake. In, you know, in the west part of Michigan, or we are going to um, survey around the state all of the places that have historic aircraft that are on exhibit or, or something like that. So you kind of get the feel that there are a few different ways to come at survey, but really it all boils down to documenting what there is and then starting to consider, is it important? Is it significant? What stories can we tell based on what we found? Um, so if we jump to the next slide, um, the immediate follow-up to the survey and identification is that piece that says, what did we find? And what um, have we determined if it's significant and, and can we document that significance? Um, and so really across the country, we've just talked about the National Register of Historic Places and that level of designation. Um, and I wanted to pull out this specific part of the federal regulation that talks about the National Register um, that says it's an authoritative guide to be used by various levels of government private groups and citizens to identify the nation's cultural resources and to indicate what property should be considered for protection from destruction and impairment. And it basically recognizes that this is to be administered as a planning tool. Once you know what is historic or considered to be historic, then you can make informed choices about um, moving things forward in your community. And a couple of important things to know, and this kind of mirrors what Mallory had said earlier, the SHPO nominates properties for the National Register, but we do not list them. This is the National Register. It's administered by the National Park Service, but those sort of recommendations are brought to them through the SHPO office. Um, SHPO provides guidance to individuals, local governments, nonprofits, and others as they develop nomination materials for National Register listing. They work very closely with us. Um, and so once uh, a nominating uh, group or person um, has worked with the SHPO and we've kind of worked out what we would call a, a final draft. It goes before another state entity called the State Historic Preservation Review Board and they need to approve this nomination before it gets sent on to the National Park Service. 
And the members of the review board um, are professionals with backgrounds in architecture, archaeology, history, um, and, and a number of other disciplines. And really, they're not there to say, we don't think this place is valuable or significant. They are more just taking a, a broad step back look and saying, you're telling us about the wonderful story of the courthouse in this community, uh, but did you consider this angle or what, you know, this part of the story you need to fill in a little more detail or something like that. So really it's just putting a polish, a final touch on it before we send it to the federal government and we say, we think this is important. You should include this in the National Register of Historic Places. So if we jump forward, um, I just wanted to show off some of the variety and some of the, the interesting places around the state that have been listed in the National Register. Um, and again, this is, this is the program that SHPO has the most involvement when it comes to historic designation. So um, this is the downtown area in Ionia, um, the commercial district that uh, certainly is important for its architectural significance, right? A lot of good historical features and materials in those buildings, the signage, the windows, everything. But also this is sort of the center of the Ionia community. And so this speaks to the pattern of development and the places of, of commercial significance within the development of Ionia for the almost 200 years that it's been there. Uh, next we have, um, this is the apartment or the, the duplex that Rosa Parks, right? Major civil rights um, activist and, and figurehead in the civil rights movement. Um, this is where she lived in Detroit. And so this is not a particularly architecturally significant house, but this is associated with a very important person um, in the history of the 20th century uh, in the United States. And so, um, you know, what are the important uh, things that she did while she lived in Detroit? That's why that house is significant. Um, it's not just buildings. Uh, this is the Upper Twin Falls Bridge, which actually spans the Michigan-Wisconsin border in the Upper Peninsula. Um, and so this is a very early style iron truss bridge. The highway, um, there's a new bridge nearby, so the highway doesn't cross it, but it's part of a walking and recreation trail um, and is basically original to when it was constructed um, in this design, largely unchanged. Uh, next we have uh, another sort of um, uh, symbol of Michigan, if you will. Uh, you may know that Michigan has more lighthouses than any other state in the United States. Um, there's over 120 of them. Um, and before the era of, you know, GPS and radio communications, lighthouses were how ships navigated on treacherous waters around the Great Lakes. And so almost every lighthouse um, that exists in Michigan that is historic has been listed in the National Register. Um, you know, they're all very similar, but each one is unique in its own special way. Um, and some great stories about um, ship rescues and light keepers and just maritime history in general come together at lighthouses. And so a lot of these symbols of Michigan are, are in the National Register. Uh, next we have uh, sort of an interesting element of the National Register, which are historic resources that move um, and sometimes they don't stay in the same place. So there are um, historic vessels and ships in the National Register. There are historic train locomotives. There are airplanes. Um, and, and the list goes on of sort of unique things that may not stay in one place, um, but still embody that historic significance. Um, and uh, this is the 1225 steam locomotive near Owasso, which uh, has been restored and they run excursions with it. Um, and that's perhaps one of the loudest <laughs> um, resources in the National Register. We jump to the next slide. Um, an important thing also about the National Register is if your site is listed in the register, you are not obligated to make it available to the public. Um, it doesn't have to be open a certain number of days or anything like that. Um, and sometimes sites or places are listed on the National Register almost with the intention that they will hardly ever be seen uh, regularly by humans, but that documentation of the history and significance is still so important. Um, and so this is the Norman shipwreck, which is located off Presque Isle, which is up in the Alpena area in Lake Huron, um, where there are many different shipwrecks. And so a lot, uh, um, several of them now have been listed in the National Register talking about, of course, what was the ship like when um, it was sailing? Where did it go? What ports did it go? And what did it carry? Um, but also, how did it sink? What happened to the crew? Um, and then in what condition is it in perhaps on the bottom of the lake? So really, the National Register is, covers a broad spectrum of um, places, uh, large and small, across Michigan. And we're adding new sites to it every single year. 
So if we can go to the next slide. Um, the next area is uh, uh, sort of that the SHPO works in is development and incentives. And I will say that every week we get phone calls and emails. Hi, I just bought an old building. Uh, do you have any money to help me fix it up? And unfortunately, just as a quick <laughs> rain on your parade right up front, there is no pot of money in the state of Michigan currently um, to hand out for grants uh, or loans from state government to help repair old buildings. Unfortunately, there isn't. Um, and um, it's other, some other states do offer something like that, but Michigan is not one of those. But one of the incentives we do offer is this Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. Um, very quickly in summary, it can only be applied to traditional, what would, what would be considered income producing properties. So that's typically commercial properties or something like an apartment building. Um, the property in question must be listed in the National Register of Historic Places or considered to be a contributing building to a historic district. Um, the work that's being done must be substantial. So it's not just, oh, we're gonna repaint the interior or exterior, but it has to be substantial work to um, sort of breathe new life into the structure or building. And the work must be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. So those items that, that Mallory mentioned earlier um, about best practices, we always recommend that people follow as a recommendation the secretary's standards. But for tax credit projects specifically, they must follow those standards or they won't get the tax credit. So it really is a powerful incentive for them to keep the historic material, preserve as much of it as possible, um, and really retain that look and feel of the historic building as it moves potentially into a new use. We can go to the next slide. Real quick, I just wanted to show off a couple of, of fairly recent tax credit successes. Um, this is the former armory building in Owasso. Um, you know, it was used for um, National Guard and sort of military and related functions for decades, and then they didn't need the structure anymore. Um, and so what do you do with something that had a very specific purpose and that purpose is no longer needed? This building has been rehabbed um, and now it's, a, a, um, it's partially office space. It's partially an entrepreneur sort of training learning space. Um, there's some flexible office um, and conference room space there. And so they really kind of looked at their community and said, what do we need in Owasso in Shiawassee County? What are the needs? And then how can we fit them into this building that had a lot of large open spaces, which was great because they could kind of divide it up based on the uses that they, that they needed in their community. And now it brings this property you know, back. It's got new life. And clearly it's a you know, architecturally interesting building to, to see and visit. Uh, the next slide is a second recent tax credit project. This is the Cadillac House Hotel, which is in Lexington, just north of Port Huron. Um, Lexington is small, maybe 1,500 people. This is a former hotel that's 150 years old. It's right at the four corners of their downtown. And like five years ago, there was a restaurant occupying one of the first floor and the rest of it was vacant. Um, the upper stories had been covered in a really bad shingle, half roof thing. You couldn't even see the historic building underneath. It looked totally different. And that old restaurant closed, the building was totally empty, and a developer came in with the specific intention of reopening it as a, a sort of a bed and breakfast style lodging establishment, bringing people, visitors to Lexington and reopening sort of the first floor restaurant dining space as a tavern. Um, and so sort of after a, a wonderful transformation, they did a lot of historical research. They looked at old photographs um, and they took out some walls that had been added and found a lot of original material. And they were able to utilize the preservation tax credits to help sort of give this building a new rebirth back to its original, which I think is fascinating and interesting. So that's another good example of a tax credit project. Uh, next we have, um, I mentioned that we do not have grants at SHIP for specific homeowners or property owners. We do have two very specific grant programs. Um, and I'm going to talk about both. The first one is the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program. So if you happen to own a historic lighthouse, we may be able to help you. Um, our grants with a $60,000 maximum, they do require a match. Um, they can be used for planning uh, or for actual rehabilitation repair work. 
Um, typically, it's a government unit or a related nonprofit organization that applies to us. Um, and uh, these go to help restore and preserve historic lighthouses, these icons of the Great Lakes State. Um, interestingly, you can help um, sort of preserve these lighthouses if you get a Save Our Lights, Save Our Lights fundraising license plate. Um, that's one of the specialty license plates you can get through the Secretary of State. A portion of those fundraising dollars go into a fund, and that fund is what we use to give out these MLAP grants every year. And since the program has been around since 2000, you know, over two and a half million dollars has been awarded for lighthouse preservation grants. And of course, since that money has to be matched, it's an even larger investment in these historic lighthouses across Michigan. So definitely think about getting that license plate when it's time to renew um, every year. Uh, next, this is the other gr grant program that the SHPO offers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, SHPO receives a portion of its annual funding from the federal government. It comes through a, a channel called the Historic Preservation Fund. Um, and as part of our um, existence, we are required to pass through 10% of that HPF money from the federal government to what are called certified local government communities. Um, and these are communities that have local preservation best practices in place. They have a historic district ordinance. Um, and they've, they've sort of made it preservation a priority at the municipal level. Um, and so really this adds a new piece. To, there's already the federal government working with the SHPO in each state, but now it's the federal government, the SHPO, and a local community all working together to accomplish preservation goals um, in that particular town or city. And so these CLG communities, of which there are currently 31 in Michigan, and we're about to add a, a 32nd one here in the next few months, um, can apply for um, a CLG grant. Uh, every year, there's one opportunity to do so. Typically, it's about $120,000 that the SHPO can give out in grant funding, and we typically fund between two and four CLG grants every year. Um, uh, and this again could be for planning documents, so um, plans and specs, historic structure report, something like that, um, or actual nuts and bolts rehabilitation type work um, that takes place in that community. Typically, it's something that's owned by the municipality outright or, or by a nonprofit partner. Um, and that just very briefly covers the two grant programs that the SHPO does offer every year. We go to the next slide very quickly. The third area is the protection and planning area. Um, I mentioned early on that Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act grants legal status to historic preservation in federal planning, decision making, and project execution. And really, what it does is it requires all federal agencies to take into account their effects, the effects of their actions on historic properties. So, just like any project has to consider endangered species pollution, um, water quality issues, they also have to take into account what will happen to historic resources within the, the area of potential effects around where the project is going to take place. Um, and so really this was reactionary to urban development and the federal highway program, you know, where, where demolition was, was running rampant, decisions were not being made in conjunction with local communities. Um, this was the mechanism to say, wait a minute, this gives local communities a voice and it gives historic preservation sort of a, um, a seat at the table. And so you might be wondering what kind of projects are subject to this section 106. Um, that would be a highway or road project that gets federal dollars. Um, and you might be thinking that might just be interstate freeways, but really there is a certain amount of federal funding that goes to county um, road commissions and local road authorities. And so even you know, small road projects sometimes have federal funding and that triggers this section 106 process. Every time a new cell phone tower is constructed, it has an FCC license attached to it. So there is a section 106 review that takes place saying, is this cell phone tower going to obstruct the view um, or, or do something negative to a historic site nearby? Um, when the Army Corps of Engineers or the National Park Service or EPA um, proposes doing any work in a community, all of the work has to be submitted to SHPO in advance for us to review and comment on to make sure they're um, 
hopefully are no negative consequences for historic resources, or if there are, come to a agreement ahead of time to minimize the impact on historic resources. Um, that's basically very succinctly how the Section 106 process works. And I would say in Michigan, we review uh, five or 6,000 federal projects every year that come through in all counties across the state. If we can go to the next slide, real quick, the other part is the planning portion. Um, we're required by the National Park Service as a condition of this federal funding we received to do a five-year statewide preservation plan. Um, and it is largely driven by stakeholder and public participation. Um, we have a new plan that's just going to go into effect um, for the years 2020 through 2024. Um, and it is totally, um, or a lot of public comment was taken at five different meetings around the state and by an online survey um, to sort of guide the uh, priorities and the principles that go into this preservation plan. Um, it's meant to be a statewide plan. It's not just a plan that says the SHPO will do this, this, and this in the next five years. It's more to say, here are the priorities in Michigan for historic preservation. How can we accomplish these things between government, individuals, nonprofits, and other stakeholders? And so with that, brief summary, that's what the historic, State Historic Preservation Office does. All right, yeah, so here's a, just a brief side by side of the two organizations. Um, we both serve two different roles, um, but we also work uh, with communities uh, simultaneously and together. It is always um, a, a, a group project when it comes to preservation. And so uh, the more the merrier, um, it really is about creating relationships with one another and and working towards those common goals. So um, if you are still unsure about which organization to reach out to first, um, that is perfectly okay. We're happy to um, have you send us an email um, is the best way to get a hold of us. Um, my phone, I am still able to, to, to receive phone calls that that, that number on your screen. Um, and Nathan, since he's out of the office, is that is not the number that would be the most convenient right to reach you at. Um, Correct. Yeah, but if you go to the website for SHPO, which is michigan.gov slash SHPO, there's a whole staff list with email addresses um, and direct phone numbers and that sort of thing. So you can find us if you need us. Right, right. And so again, if you're unsure of whom to reach out to first, don't let that stop you. Send us uh, one of us an email or, or anybody from one of our organizations. And if we need to point you in the in the right direction, we are more than happy to do that for you. So um, we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, so if you have questions, you want know, to type them in again, uh, we did go over an hour, but there's just so much to learn about preservation and it's preservation month and we love spending time with you. Um, so if you need to hop off, uh, don't worry. Again, uh, this is being recorded and you will be sent a link. Um, but if you have a question, do type it in before you, uh, before you leave us today. Um, so there was a question about sharing a link to the MSU study that Nathan mentioned earlier in the webinar. Um, I'm gonna have to dig that out, um, but we will send that around. Um, there will be a follow-up email that goes out again with the link to the recording. So I will make sure to include a link to that study as well. Um, Another question came in talking about um, the MHPN economics benefit study. Um, it is getting a bit dated. It is about 20 years old. And is there any talk about doing an updated study? And that is a really great question. Um, we would love to do an updated study. Um, one of these studies costs north of $70,000. Um, so we are um, always looking for funding opportunities that might help us cover that cost so we can do something like that in the near future because it does add so much value um, when you can bring somebody those updated numbers. Uh, our economy has changed many times over the last 20 years, even in the last uh, couple months. So um, that is a really good point and we are aware and we're looking for ways to change that. Um, there was a question that came in um, about how would a city go about becoming a certified local government? Um, and before I turn that over to Nathan for SHPO, I do want to let you know that we did have a, a webinar focusing on the Certified Local Government Program, and we did record that, and that recording is available. Um, so I will um, put that 
recording link in the email that goes out with this one as well. Um, but Nathan, I will let you briefly describe that process um, before this individual is able to uh, check out that webinar. Oh, I was just going to say, watch the webinar. If all the answers <laughs> <during> the webinar. <laughs> um, but yeah, actually, so, um, so Alan Higgins, who is the Certified Local Government Coordinator at the SHPO office, um, did, that, did that webinar in partnership with MHPN just last week. Um, and he um, has only been working for the SHPO for about a year, but he has really been making some great progress, both in re with re-engaging CLG communities and also um, helping to bring new communities forward, get them through the process, which isn't, it's not complicated, but there are just several steps. Um, and really it has to be, it has to be brought forward by the local community. The local community has to, to stand up and say, look, we value preservation. We want to make this an important part of our planning process. It, it can't be forced. It has to come from the local community. Um, and, and then the path forward to becoming a CLG is much more straightforward and easy. Um, and Alan would be happy to speak with you. Um, and again, if you go to the SHPA website or I can, I can provide an email address as well um, for Alan and he'll be happy to speak with you, certainly. Excellent, thank you, Nathan. Um, and we did have a question come in just about length of, of webinars um, in the future. Um, this one was scheduled to be an hour, but again, uh, we're thanks for sticking around with us. We have there's just so much to share, so we we went over and um, we're happy. Uh, I, I thank Nathan for his time uh, and willingness to to share a little bit extra with us today. Um, our future webinars, the one on designations, is scheduled for an hour and a half just because we know there is a lot in that topic to, uh, to get through. Um, so that one is an hour and a half. The tax credit one is currently scheduled for, to be about an hour. And most of the ones into the future, they'll range between an hour and an hour and a half, but that information will be in the registration um, uh, when you register that, that information will be there. So just pay attention to that. Um, we like it. To, uh, an hour is kind of nice and succinct, but we are um, starting to tackle some bigger um, complex questions and, and topics and bringing in few, a few more presenters. So we want to make sure that we can give them the time they need to communicate what they want to. So um, we're really looking forward to uh, announcing our June and July webinars. Um, so like I said, uh, keep in uh, touch with us. Our, um, the link that I shared in the comments um, to our website, to our workshops, we'll have all of our uh, links to register as the webinars registration goes live. Um, and if you are on social media, we are most active on Facebook at this time. So that's the best place to like and follow us. And we will be present, um, sharing uh, those links to register for our webinars and sharing those topics there as well. Um, again, if you have any questions about MHPM, we're at www mhpn.org. Thank you so much for your time today. Nathan, do you have anything that you want to um, say before we uh, head out? Uh, just that SHPO is also on uh, both Facebook and Twitter. So if you, uh, you want to look us up, you'll be happy to find us. And uh, you might see the same positive news being shared by both MHPN and SHPO from time to time. But we also share kind of different material as well. So if you're interested in historic preservation, you can follow both of us. Please do. All right. Well, thank you all again for your time today and happy Preservation Month. If you have anything that you would like to share with us, um, again, follow us on social media or send us an email and we'd uh, love to help you um, in your communities towards your preservation goals. So have a great day. Um, the sun is out and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.